I'm Lee. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Sonix. Uh, Sonix is an app that you'll be able to download in four weeks, which helps musicians make mon more money from their super fans through exclusive content, NFTs, and money can't buy experiences. So if you have your phone at the end, please go on to sonix.com um, and sign up so you can stay in the know. But right now, we are here to talk about the business of um, influencer marketing and I'm joined by two incredible people who will be able to give you more insight on what that looks like right now and my first person that I'd love to introduce is Lola from TikTok and Kingsley who is the, uh, Lola sorry who's the creator manager at TikTok and Kingsley who is the founder of Mixtape Madness um, so first of all guys I'd love if you could give a sort of micro version of your careers how did you end up on this stage today Hi, can everyone hear me? Um, lovely to be here. So yes, as um, Lee said, I am Lola. I'm a Creative Partnerships Manager at TikTok. Um, essentially, I'll give a little um, understanding of what that means. Um, so what I do, I specifically work with um, TV and entertainment style creators on TikTok. Um, and what I do is identify who the top ones are um, and really just kind of like guide them into um, yeah, progressing professionally um, in the entertainment space. Um, and how I got here, um, initially I worked at Red Bull um, in the marketing team and um, what we would do amazing events, music events, cultural events, um, and we always wanted to reach you know bigger audiences and larger audiences. Um, and what I would do is yeah create some small experiences and invite um, people that I would see on YouTube or Instagram um, platforms and just yeah invite them to those events um, and cover it. And what we would see is just huge engagement. Um, better than you know any type of coverage that you know the traditional media would do. It would really like you know push forward like the, our messages um, as a brand. Um, I was doing that more and more, um, and yeah, I I stumbled across a role at TikTok, um, which was yeah to do exactly that on a bigger scale, um, and I felt like TikTok was a fantastic platform. Um, because we were seeing loads of creators doing great things um, and I believe that we, can tr we could um, transition that from not just the digital space but into the reality of entertainment. Um, so that is my short story of how I got here. Um, I'll pass it over to Kingsley. Hello everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks for the intro, Lee. Um, and thanks to the Black Tech Fest for um, having us down here. Um, I'm Kingsley, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, a music platform called Mixtape Madness. Um, we started 2009-2010 uh, um, and the original idea for Mixtape Madness was always around creating uh, a space for um, musicians to promote their music and we started off as a simple website and um, over the years we've kind of moved across into various different platforms from SoundCloud to YouTube. Um, to Twitter, to Instagram, to TikTok, to Snapchat, and you name it. And now um, it's developed from a simple website where people could download mixtapes and share it to their fans, to now be in this, um, I guess, I consider it as this new age music platform where we are part record label, so we actually sign artists and release music um, via our distribution partners um, onto the, obviously the various streaming platforms. And we are also a part um, media uh, platform where we have a massive following and a massive audience and we are able to influence um, the black British music culture with the kind of music we're putting out on, um, obviously from the label side, but also from the music and the talent that we're championing within our platform. Um, and yeah, like I said, you know, we, we do have a big enough audience that spreads across, so we have the ability to influence culture and just work with um, wider brands and uh, other organizations to kind of just continue to push that culture. Um, how I got here today, um, you know, um, I grew up in Hackney and uh, I took the traditional routes, uh, school, uni, college, university, uh, finished university and I actually worked um, for a few years um, as a, well, a web developer. Um, so. Uh, 
but while I was just before before um, I I finished uni, that's when Mixtape Madness started up. So I started as a, as a side hustle. Um, over the years, obviously we got bigger, we got more popular, and um, I guess we started to make more money uh, through the different avenues in which that we do now, which allowed me to kind of go full time into the business. And um, yeah, now I'm here. Um, I'm definitely a student of, of of this game. I think Lola is uh, amazing in the work that she's done and she's doing at TikTok at the moment, and obviously Lee at Songs as well. So. Um, I'm definitely more, I'm a student of the game today and um, I, I hope I can give as much as I can uh, uh, re uh, uh, receive from these two amazing guys. Yeah, I wouldn't say that though. I think that you've obviously been able to see how the industry has changed quite a bit. So I think your perspective is going to be quite interesting today and obviously Lola's working on it in a sort of day-to-day -day basis. So I think from the two of you, you should really be able to see how much impact influence marketing has. So on that point, Lola, what is influencer marketing for those in the audience who don't quite know? So influencer marketing is for me when you use, um, well, when you use an influencer, a digital creator, um, someone who has a following on a digital space to kind of push forward a message for a brand or I would say maybe reach new audiences for a band. So all of these digital creators, etc., they have their own audience. So it's really about how brands can utilize that to yeah, push forward their message or if they have an action, um, for example, that's what I would say it is. Kingsley? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I think Lola hit, hit the nail on the head. Um, it literally, uh, from my point of view, I think the word influence of marketing um, has obviously evolved over time and from I guess um, my perspective I see there is um, many different types of influencers I think social media has created the idea of um, I guess the, the influences that we see on social media but obviously before that there's there's a range of people who have influence and you know I could say that Mix It Madness has a form of influence because we have a following and we're able to connect with an audience and use that audience to connect with other brands as well so um, I definitely see influencer marketing as um, just not it's not just necessarily an individual it's just um, it's not a set individual but it's uh, a, a person or, or a someone or a platform or a company or an organization that has an influence over people. On that point about sort of a range of talent and, you know, being an influencer and being influential are two different things. I remember in a previous life, I used to be a talent agent and I used to manage uh, Clara Ampho from Radio One, uh, Montana Brown from Love Island, Patricia Bright from YouTube. And whenever I used to tell other black creators that uh, I used to manage Patricia Bright, they used to sort of roll their eyes, not because they didn't love Patricia, but they felt like she was the only one being booked for jobs. And so I kind of wanted to ask you guys, have you felt like the landscape has changed? And um, why do you think that is? Um, so for myself, definitely it has changed. Um, you know, I work with about 100 creators and I would say that about 50% of them are black. Um, when I did start at TikTok, that was definitely not the case. I'm definitely seeing more and more creators um, of color monetizing off these um off these platforms and having like more um yeah more brand partnerships um and booked for jobs and i'll say the reason is one i know it was a very traumatic time for us but that black lives matter movement in 2020 was very very impactful for the industry i think you know a lot of businesses a lot of outlets they could no longer hide behind you know um saying that they couldn't find black talent they were forced um, to use black talent. So I think that was definitely a catalyst for change there. Um, but also, you know, you have like people like myself um, within these businesses that are a reflection of that talent. So we're able to like vouch for, for our talent. We have the data and insights which prove, you know, that I think the hesitation from a lot of brands was, you know, is it going to translate? You know, if we invest in this talent, are they, is, it, is there going to be a return on investment? Whereas if you have someone like myself or you know, even someone um, you know, like both of you guys, if you're, you're there vouching for that talent and you're a voice that they trust and they know um, within the industry, they, they're, they're more likely um, to use that talent. And an example is that, for example, is you know, last year we 
at TikTok, we weren't doing red carpet premieres. Um, and, you know, they really wanted to use traditional, um, often white um, presenters. Um, and we vouched for Tega Alexander and they, they said yes. And that was just based on based on myself. Did I know that he would deliver? No, not really. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, they took that chance on him and he, he did great. You know, he was a part of the launching Lady Gaga on TikTok. Um, that was a huge moment. Um, and yeah, he's now so, like been able to do so, so much more work in that space. Um, so yeah, like there's, there's definitely, um, there's definitely a change. There's definitely a lot of choice in terms of like digital creators to choose from. So at this point, there is no excuse um, to not use um, diverse talent um, in that field. And Kingsley, how have you seen, obviously you've been in this industry a lot longer, you've probably seen many changes in terms of, you know, uh, traditional talent, how traditional talent have had to change and make sure that they're part of what's going on digitally as well. Have you seen, I guess, talk to us a little bit about those changes um, as someone that has worked with talent that are used to working in a more traditional sort of space? Yeah, I think... Um in music, uh, the last few years we've all, for, for, for black British music for me definitely has um, become more popular in culture. So it's not, it, it's less underground and it's more mainstream, which means um, the people that actually really consume um, our music is not just um, black individuals. There's more like Caucasian kids that are in Scotland um, uh, the girls, um, not just men, it's girls that are consuming the music. So because of that, now, um, f for me, I've definitely seen much more um, of the black British talent being uh, used or being seen in much more of a bigger limelight than um, traditionally. And, you know, we have seen, like, for us, like, we have the likes of Stormzy, who is able to, um, who's transcended that because, you know, he has a, an influence and he's able to, you know, sell number one records, but then he's also able to um, open his own, um, uh, do his own festival with Murky Fest and do his whole movement with the, uh, the published, the, 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 the book publishing that, um, that he does. And he's got like uh, black writers on there as well. So it's, it's been a massive shift because um, black, First of all, black British music has has evolved and has become much more popular. In and obviously, it's it's, it's great because it's breaking barriers and it's it allows us to have much more um, leverage or have much more uh, people who can influence and kind of change the culture more. So yeah, there's there's definitely been a massive shift and um, yeah, I've seen I have seen lots of shifts and you know we look at. Um, again, my, I always see about black creators or, or, or creators of black origin that um, have evolved, such as um, some of our content creators in Chunks, Philly, Harry Panera and these kind of guys. So these people ha are starting to become more popular figures um, within just society, which is evolving the, the, the black creator or creators market or uh, industry or, or um, the idea of black creators, should I say. Um, Lola, I'm going to come for you a little bit. <laughs> um, so obviously there's one thing, obviously being on the platform and um, using the platform um, consistently, being creative on the platform, but you know, it goes without saying that black creators sometimes have felt like their content is not being seen. It felt like the algorithm wasn't um, boosting them as much as some of their white counterparts, or even if they were coming up with creative um, uh, formats on TikTok, only until a white influencer decided to create the same content was it being seen or noticed in the same way, or people didn't realize that, oh my God, this thing is now trending everywhere, but it started by this black creator way, way, way um, weeks or months ago. So. Um, I guess I'd love to sort of see, uh, hear your perspective on, on that. Um, so, yeah, one, one thing like in regards to that, in terms of like trend setting and, um, you know, attributing back like, you know, trends or popular things um, in the app, it is, it is quite difficult um, from a tech perspective, but I would definitely say like that's something that is being currently addressed, like 
at the moment I know that there's a, um, a new feature that we're launching in terms of like Black History Month. We really want to um, ensure that people are using it is the creator credit tool. Um, so that was direct, that is a tool that has been directly um, born out of like addressing the fact that black creators are not getting like the accolades um, for the, the trends that they are creating on the app. Um, so something like that is, you know, you can use it where essentially you go into the app and you literally press like and click who created a certain, um, certain trend. Um, I would definitely say like in back in 2020 or 2021, there wasn't that many of us on the app. So a lot of the time, the, the popular creators, like the, the biggest creators were the likes of Charlie Domingo and all of those guys. But now we look at 2022 and Kaby Lame is the biggest um, creator on the platform in the world. Um, so it's something that is changing. There's definitely tools that we're trying to use within the app to ensure that you know, our black creators or those originators are really, really um, getting, yeah, getting the, the praise that they deserve. I would say like, for example, with CK's like huge moment earlier um, this year, we ensured as a platform that, I know in the, there was a US um, dance trend that got really popular, but we ensured that in the UK, that Nifa with the, cause she, she greatly, contributed to the success of that song and we ensured that as a platform we made sure that we highlighted her significantly so we are doing the work it is tough like I'm not I don't design tech I'm I'm on the creative side um, I know it's really tough in terms of like the science but um, in terms of like spotlighting as much as possible we're trying to do as much as pos possible and we are really open to new ways and mechanisms that we can do that more and more for our black creators. I know I over-index when I um, put creators forward for certain, for certain opportunities, so I ensure that they get that visibility on that side as well. I think that, you know, obviously uh, having praise, being seen um, is one thing. I think obviously being paid correctly is another. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's many different reasons why people aren't or creators aren't paid properly. I think sometimes you don't know how much you should be paid. I think sometimes from someone who's worked on the PR and brand side, sometimes your goal is to save as much as that budget as possible. And so if you have a £50,000 budget and a, you ask a creator how much is your fee and they're like £100, you're like, well, OK, kind of thing. Um, why do you feel like black talent is generally un underpaid? Um, and I guess, what do you think that they can do to ensure that they are getting paid as much as their white counterparts? That's a really good question and it's really, really tough to answer. Um, I think one part of not the reason why they may not be paid as much as their, as their counterparts is one, because I think it may be the first time that a lot of these brands are using black creators. So there's no, there's a lack of confidence when it comes to actually um, investing in that talent. So for example, for some of, some of these um, red carpets and brand campaigns that I do, it would have been the first time that they've used a black creator. And even from my side, they really do lowball, um, lowball um, in terms of the fee, um, because it's, I guess it's less of a risk um, for them, um, but you know, it's you have to kind of like they kind of like leverage the exposure. This is a great opportunity, you know, interviewing someone like Lady Gaga or Tom Cruise. That is almost that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So a lot of the time, I think this is across the board in terms of creator um, creator marketing. It's across the board. So a lot of the time, they leverage, they use the the exposure and the opportunity. Add to yeah, that's a justification um, for lowering the, the the fee. I think another thing is like education from from um, the influencer and creator side as well. You need to understand. You, there needs to be a calculation of what you will accept and what you won't accept, and kind of be really yeah. I, I know you do, people don't want to lose out on jobs, but you have to be quite strict with that and really understand the justification for why you are charging a certain fee. 
and that should be based on your data, your insights, but also like, yeah, you know, what, how you value yourself and your time um, in terms of your creation. I think a lot of the time when it's a negotiation, you know, people want to pay as low as possible, brands want to pay as low as possible, I want to pay as low as possible when I'm getting creators. But if there's a clear justification of, okay, well, this is my, this is my fee and this is why this is my fee, then you can hopefully get get as close to that as possible. Um, I have like personally, I can't say of examples where I've seen a white creator being offered a lot more significantly more than a black creator in my experience. But all I do is make sure that I provide the like as much information as possible to our creators of how how they should justify um, their fees. Um, but it's just it's a very tough space. It's a very new to a lot of businesses a lot of businesses don't they might have one thousand pounds and think that they can get the top creator with that fee and it just doesn't work like that so i think a lot of education needs to be done on the brand side as well um, and understand that they need to allocate a lot more budget if they want to get a significant amount of reach um, for something another reason as well is that views likes engagement is not guaranteed so you can, off, you can give someone a fee, um, but just because they regularly get 10K, it doesn't mean that video is gonna do um, those views. So there's a lot of ambiguity when it comes to like that, that space. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it's quite tough, but I would just say that black creators, know your worth, understand your data, understand your insights, um, and yeah, don't, don't sell yourself short. I think they're, there are times that maybe you can do things for exposure, but it's not every day. <laughs> do you feel like, um, depending on the market in which a particular campaign is trying to reach, does that affect as well the the value in which um, a, a, a black a, a creator, black or Caucasian, whatever it is, um, affects that? Because if you are trying to reach, um, if you've got a product that's reaching more of a, a white market, then do you feel like that's going to change the race um, for I, black creators? Can I, can I answer that question? Yeah, go on, go on. So I used to always say to Clara and Patricia, um, or any of the talent that I was going to work with, is figure out what your niche is. Because once you have your niche, you can then start to really play with how much you get paid. Because at the end of the day, it, you know, with Clara, if they're booking Clara, there are very few other people that they, could, they have on that list. So I used to be like, don't focus on what Maya Jam is doing or what Vic Hope is doing, because they do what they do very well. But if you focus on what you're doing and your name's the only one on that list, whether it's a white brand or whether it's a black brand or whatever it is, when they come and they say, um, and this has happened, um, we only have 5,000 pounds for Clara to host. I'm like, that doesn't work. Um, uh, what's her fee? I say, well, it was 40 grand. Oh, we don't have that. Okay, cool. In two weeks, oh, we found 40 grand. Is it? Did you find first class travel as well? Yes, we found first class travel. Do you know what I mean? So I think, I think once you have your niche and you figure out and you don't try and do what everyone else is doing, then it's easier for you to do that. Be extremely confident in that as well because you have to have a level of confidence that they're going to come back. Um, and that's why I say, like, know your worth and understand it because once you have that on, in your head, you're not gonna you're not gonna lowball yourself, and I think it, yeah, like a lot of people do lowball themselves because they feel like that opportunity is never come gonna come back, and there's maybe ten of other people behind them them that can yeah that can do the job. But in actuality, they want you, and that's why they emailed you. And we only have ten days to actually execute the campaign. Do you so. feel like like some people actually sometimes is it is is it a case of just um, uh, brands just uh, what's it how do I say this like just uh, not culture vulturing but like just uh, uh, following a trend because they see what this creator is doing they just want to um, make use of them as and when it is so do you feel like that also affects I think I think it's a it's a business at the end of the day and, and their job is to uh, find trends and find things that they think will sell and unfortunately, you would hope that everybody has integrity and um, uh, enough respect for other people's creativity to 
come back to them and say, you know, we want to work with you, but it doesn't always work that way. And unfortunately, when you get into it, you know, a lot of it is your personal thing why you've decided to create that piece of content. But from the brand's perspective, it's business and it's, it's about how much views and how much money they can make. So unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, but the great thing also is that we have social media so that we can call those things out. But I, I do want to come back to you a little bit, Kingsley, because we've spoken a lot about TikTok. And I think that um, it's important because, you know, there are a lot of people who have platforms from using Twitter and become editors. You have a lot of people who um, have podcasts and have created Netflix documentary shows. I do think it's important sometimes to look outside of short form content and probably advise people. How can you, you touched it a little bit in your um, opening intro. Um, how else can you be influential in a way that is impactful if you're somebody that says, you know what, TikTok, Instagram, it's not for me? Yeah, I think um, it's just finding your niche. I think we've said it a lot in, in these, uh, Lolo said it a lot and um, uh, Lee said it a lot, that um, you just find in your niche. I mean, a great example, and uh, a friend of mine, um, ZZ Mills, like she started on uh, social platforms just commentating or what, what, whatever, however she'd like support. And now, um, she, you know, she's moved on to having her own show on YouTube. And then now I see her in um, uh, ITV uh, giving her, her viewpoints on whatever she gives her viewpoints on, or I'll see her on, um, uh, uh, is it British Bake Off or one of these yeah. th things on Channel 4? Yeah, so she's kind of like moved away from just being um, just uh, clips on, on uh, Instagram. Funny enough, actually, she actually, I, I know she, she used to do acting and stuff, so she's kind of made her way through by just sticking to her niche. And I just feel like that literally is what um, like the most important thing is. And I'm sure we hear it all the time. Um, but I think as long as we're strategic enough to kind of stick to our niche, like you will find creators that are, or influencers that are um, breaking out of the norm. KSI is another example who was just a guy on YouTube that was reacting to videos and now he's a musician, a boxer, uh, he's got the whole sideman thing going on. And then, you know, like I said, like some of our flagship guys like Chunks, Philly, um, Harry Pinero, who are doing amazing things on not just creating content, but um, also I'm sure on TikTok, but I see them at uh, award shows hosting stuff for other different brands, Amazon and Netflix and what may have you. Um, and even like um, uh, Femi from um, uh, adulthood, kidulthood, um, you know, he started as an actor and now, you know, he's got his own um, production company. Um, so, you know, all these guys are, and again, it just goes back to my point of like influencers, or the idea of influencers for me came from the fact of just somebody who has an influence and is able to use that. And I think we was talking about earlier on as well about John Boyega as well. Again, another person who is, who's an actor now gone to become starting directing and these kind of things. So um, sticking to your niche and being very tactile and strategic about how and, and the way in which you want to break the market is important. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So, um uh, I just want to touch on that last point. Unfortunately, we've only got five more minutes. So if you guys did have any questions, then feel free to grab one of us at the end. Um, but the last question I wanted to ask you was really around sort of this quote that we hear a lot of the time about having a seat at the table. Um, and I understand that because, you know, you want to have your own voice and be seen in your industry. But sometimes you end up um, with that seat at the table and your seat is lower than everybody else. The table's a little bit dusty. You know, the, there's no back, you know. And so um, I think sometimes it's really exciting to uh, look at creating your own table. And with these influencers, black creators, you know, especially when they cross the mainstream, there's a lot of power and opportunity that comes with that. So I'd love to hear from you guys on sort of what would you like to see them do with that power? And how, you know, where, what areas do you feel like we need to have progress in? And what I mean by that is, you know, you have people like Rihanna who hasn't released a song in about eight or nine years because she's selling makeup, right? Uh, you have people like Viola Davis who now are at a point where they can have their own production company and make their own films. And I think that that's where the true sort of change comes. And so, you know, I'd love to hear from you guys. What would you like to see UK black creators do with that power? Ladies first. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so for me, I, I think I would love more creators to have more of a long-term goal just in general. So when you have, like, understand that being the top creator or being the, you know, the biggest person, 
that is very, very short term. You're not always going to be at the top of your game. So always be strategic and long term in that goal. I would love more of them to start starting brands because their influence actually makes other brands money. So why wouldn't they make their own? So for example, um, on on TikTok, I'm saying it again, um, a lot of our creators are making a lot of money through e-commerce. Um, with that knowledge is how can they how can they do that themselves? So is it by clothing? Is it by merch? Is it by etc? Think of those things. If they want to be in TV, entertainment, film, how do you um, you know how do you be an example for the next generation of creators? For example, when you have shoots. Be that voice, and you know if there if there is a chance for somebody on set, if there is opportunities for you, if you have that influence to to advise people on set, like the the staff, etc. Be that person. So I would more want to see more, yeah, more brands coming out of creators, um, and yeah, you, them using their influence not just on the social side of stuff, but behind the scenes, because a lot of the time you are on set, they can be that person that advisors on what makeup artists that they use or if they have a photographer or editor etc i would like to see them um, doing a lot more of that and thinking way more long term um, and seeing how they can make those moments not just now but you know for generations to come so that's what i would like to see amazing kinsley yeah i'd, I'd definitely like to see more um people of influence um uh, disrupting industries outside of the norm um, there's a young man, I believe his name is Quadro, who um, is a massive social housing activist who is a prime example of um, someone who has, has an influence who is really disrupting the, um, the, the social housing sector within the government. Um, and even within organizations, I mean, we, we talk about um, people of influences, influence, sorry, are just like, independent people like you can be in an organization in a company and disrupt it as well so i want to see more people in um whatever company it is sky uh, bbc goldman sachs uh, what may have you like actually have influence in those higher seats as well because then those are the same people that can bring other people of influence or, or just influence other audiences to do stuff um i think even us at mixtape madness like we you know, you know, we've we've done we've we've done fairly well to just grow our audience, and now we look at the emerging content creators, platforms, um, uh, YouTube channels, and uh, people, uh, all all these other things, all these other people that are coming out of the the Black British music culture, and we always are looking at finding ways to invest back into into those to allow those other individuals, platforms and creators to flourish because essentially it's just going to help everything that we do um, as, as a music platform for. Yeah, like definitely disrupting more in, in industries uh, in industries that are outside the norm. So that's what I want to see more of. Amazing. Um, yeah, that was great, guys. Thank you so much for participating in that panel. I feel like if I didn't know what influencer marketing was, I do now. Um, and yeah, I appreciate you guys for sitting in on this panel. Um, once again, I would love it if you guys could all sign up to Sonex, which is S-O-N-X dot com, um, because we're launching in November and I'd love to, to, to see you guys all using the app. But enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for coming to this talk. Thank you. Thank you.